And so our last uh, presenter of the day is uh, Dagmar Hanek. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, thanks for the organizers to, to invite me to this fantastic workshop. Really interesting being here. Um, so this talk is it's about computation, computation modeling of some of Julie's older data, especially the color primary stuff. That I think was part of the PhD. Uh, and since we were trying to do this um, with a, a Lego arm, um, we tr uh, called this model called Lego, so the choice reaching with the Lego arm robot. And I'll talk, explain that a bit more as <coughs> go along. So, just to remind you, so since, since the new, no new variations of the, of the choice reaching task, just been presented, so I think I better kind of remind everyone what Julia published um, published earlier, and what that is going to be the basis for um, <clears throat> for our modeling uh, modeling exercise. So um, she asked, and that's, this is actually data from my own lab uh, collected by by Phil Woodley a few years ago. But we essentially copied her task. Uh, so we ask uh, people to uh, to reach for the odd color items, so that could be either a red square or a green square. And we uh, sometimes switch the color, the target color. We sometimes repeated it. We sometimes repeated it quite often. So these are sort of st uh, the color streaks in the experiment beside. And um, what you find are uh, uh, these kind of reaching uh, trajectories that are fairly straight. When the target color is repeated and fairly curved, or can be curved um, when the color um, color uh, target switch, and you can look at the average um, devi maximum deviation. Um, so the, the the amount of curvature that you find in the trajectory, and you find an increase um, in those in this maximum deviation from. Uh, <coughs> From repeat to switch trials, but you also find initiation latency um, increases during those uh, in those two conditions as well. And yeah, that's essentially what sometimes is called a color primary. Now, to model these 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 effects, we were interested in developing a, a biological plausible model. Um, Probably the best way of describing this work or kind of summarizing the, the credence behind that work is um, by the, it's explained by this um, iconic to, uh, quote from Richard Feynman, who said basically, What I cannot build, I do not understand. Right? So we were interested in building a simulation of those curved trajectories. Now, I also want to. People who uh, remind people of that um, that all models are false, right? And so there's this colleague was no exclusion for that. But I hope I can convince you that um, it's actually useful. <clears throat> so that's that's actually the Lego arm, right? So the Lego arm is actually very straightforward, um, one dimension, two dimensional. Um, Movement arm, so it makes horizontal planar, planar movement. It has a joint, a shoulder joint, and a elbow joint. So we kept it extremely simple because two dimensional movements could capture that, those curvature. Right? We don't need com high complexity, high degrees of freedom as you find in industrial robots or humans. Right? For us to capture those effects, it's enough to do horizontal. And you also see here the, the display for the robot. You see the, the odd color item, green item here, and the two distractors. You also see just the camera that was watching the, um, the, the robot and the search displays, and the signal of the camera would feed into, um, <clears throat> into, the, into the computer, into the, to the model, and the model then would do something with the signals and generate um, servo commands via USB port to the, to the Lego board. And I was quite surprised how easy that was to do. 
So this is actually a Lego mindstorm here. And I think I probably should ask <coughs> Lego to support this research. But anyway, um, so this is the reach movement that Carl Lego was executing. Right? And you see the horizontal movement. You see eventually how, how they are reaching. And this is a version of the straight movement, uh, no curvature, but I can show you a similar video where you see curvature. So how do we how do we achieve that? Oh yes. So yeah, first first ingredient is to make true on the biological plausibility framework of this model. We used a um, <clears throat> a uh, dynamic neural field first proposed by Amari in an old paper, but now 1977 paper. And this dynamic neural field consists of a um, layer of neurons that have an input, an output, uh, a global inhibition, and local excitatory condition. Right. And the basic behavior of those, of those dynamic neural fields, if you choose the right parameters, is following. So when you have this sort of input, activation, um, the um, a dynamic neural field would generate an output activation somewhere here, a out, uh, activation clock and location where there's the highest amount of activation coming into the system, coming into the uh, lab. <clears throat> and we built Coralego um, based on those, on those things. And that's actually the architecture and then rather than going through this architecture uh, in this abstract way, I want to show you lots of illustrations that hopefully make clear how the, how the system works. All right, so first uh, we uh, determined, we extracted some color maps, right? So here's the, the search display of the Lego arm, and we have two color maps, the green color map, and the red color map, and you see the blobs here indicating the location of the Now, first stage is to decide where the, where the target is. So the target selection stage. And that received the input, um, and received as input the color map, uh, the two color maps, and then had two of parallel operating detection stages. One, the odd color detection stage, and Second, the detection of the target color, um, target location. Target location map would receive um, an additive overlap of the two maps, and the odd color detection map would essentially find or the odd color detection system process would find the color map that has the highest number of um, red items, red pixels, and then in turn would inhibit that, that uh, map that it would have the highest um, uh, number of reds um, in terms of feeding in, sort of inhibiting the feeding into the target detection of the target location. So then hopefully it makes sense. And then so then ultimately the target location map would receive only activation from the odd color. Um, map and can then nicely select the location of the target. Now, like I said, these two things actually, the, the, the two things, the location and the odd color detection would actually operate in parallel, right? So what actually in reality happens, um, my, my clumsy verbal explanation, is that eventually after some time, um, the, the target appears. Right. So initially, in the in the target selection map, you would have a representation of all items. Oops. Yeah. Right, and then eventually um, the distractors are suppressed, and the target location um, is highly activated. So it generates some sort of flow. So that is actually, I think, not very exciting. 
this could be seen actually as, a, as an implementation of the bias competition theory by Simone and Duncan, that Bernard mentioned, mentioned the, uh, <coughs> this theory earlier. Um, and we've done, we've, we've done quite a bit of work in my lab on this. This is the latest installment on this, on this work uh, that I published last year. Uh, the other, also not so very new aspect is that I can implement color priming here. I can model color priming. So I can have some, some priming units that will send some sort of short-term memory, which remembers what was the color in the last, uh, the last trial, and then in turn modulates the uh, color detection, speeding up or slowing down, depending whether there's a switch or repeat of the odd color detection and consequently the, uh, the detection of the target image. <clears throat> now, the really interesting question, I think, in this project was actually, how do I map this sort of discrete representation, spatial representation of the target into a continuous movement of, of a reaching trajectory, of a reaching trajectory? How I translate it? Do I translate this visual info processing into some sort of motor control? And lucky enough, this paper by Amari gave us a bit of an answer to this. How to do this. So what he showed that with a certain parameter setting in these dynamic field fields, you can produce something called the traveling waves. Um, and those traveling waves behavior um, is the following. So let's say this is the, the initial state of the, of the layer, input peak here on the right, output peak here in the middle. Now the traveling wave mode would produce a movement like that in the output activation. So the, um, this, this input peak would sort of attract the output peak and the output peak would would smoothly move towards, towards the location of the input. Now these, these traveling waves are actually found quite frequently in, um, <clears throat> in, in the uh, visual system, but also in the motor system. So there's something biologically plausible, I think. Um, this paper here uh, finds it in the motor cortex in, in which the cross movements and uh, actually, while I was preparing the talk, I came across a review paper from the Sinovsky group on, on traveling waves. So if you want to, if you're interested in an overview of this, look at the traveling waves. This is a recent review paper. So, okay, so that's, that was one ingredient in our motor system. <clears throat> the second ingredient is, uh, is borrowed from the dynamic field theory by um, Erdag and Schöner, who suggested that there's some topological representation of movement parameters in the motor cortex. Um, and for us, that topological representation of movement parameters um, became the velocity map, right? So in this velocity map, speed and direction of the arms were present. So with this, in this, situation, um, the velocity map would, um, or this activation distribution in the velocity map, there used to be an activation peak in the center, uh, would say, okay, zero, zero movement, zero speed, right? But if there was a peak somewhere, let's say here on the right, uh, middle bit, the, uh, the arm would move to the, to the right with a sort of medium speed. But if the peak was quite at the fringes of that layer, it would go maximum. So, Obviously, that allows us now to, to modulate it, to, to, to model um, continuous movements. And, okay, so when we fed into this velocity map, right, was actually a head target difference map. How that is calculated, I can explain if you're interested in the question, uh, the question session. But for now, I just literally this map encodes how far the map, how far the um, the arm is from the target, right? And in this in this illustration, you see that the target that the arm is quite far away from the, 
on the target. <coughs> right? So that makes our velocity map, and that's something I forgot to mention, the velocity map is set up as a traveling wave dynamic neural tree. So that makes the velocity map move, the peak of the velocity map move towards the target and then towards the um, target. That in turn makes the Lego arm move towards the target. And the difference between the height map the difference between target and end gets smaller. So what you see then is the following. You see a speed up, up in terms of velocity of the arm, and then sort of slow it down once they get once the <coughs> once the arm uh, gets close to the target. And now you can also I think see quite naturally how the curvature would come about. Right? So in the curvature because of the curvature situation, the input would consist of several of those little peaks. Right? And initially of all peaks, of all, uh, of all items. Right? And, <clears throat> and if there was a destructor that was slightly higher activated, that traveling peak would actually, this, tra this traveling wave would actually move towards that destructor. Um, <clears throat> and then only once the target is localized, and the, this peak would move back to the, to the right position. So essentially the, 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 uh, the target selection stage would push around the, the traveling wave in the, um, in the philosophy. And that's why I think what Correlego says, essentially how they the curvature. Okay. So that's and that's actually uh, a result where we uh, <coughs> simulated um, to um, a color switch and a color repeat uh, trial. The color repeat trial produced a straight trajectory and the color switch trial produced a color trajectory. And the nice sort of fine product of all this is that actually the velocity map is quite similar. The velocity profile of the, of the arm is quite similar to, uh, to what you find, find in the Indian and in humans. Okay, so some sort of interim conclusion. So I think so what, what, have, what the architecture actually implements and on a theoretical level is a parallel operation between target selection and motor control. So so the, the, the motor control doesn't wait till there's a target so the target is selected and then executes the movement. No the, the, the motor control Starts, move, starts, um, starts um, initiating movement right, in before the, the target is fully known, right, and then eventually comes into the right target. Right. So that's kind of consistent with what Bernhard um, thinks should be implemented, right? Not a serial stage where first the target is selected and then the motor, the, the motor stage executes a movement, but Correlego implements parallel operation. At least that's my interpretation of what I think I suggested earlier. The second, the second point Correlego makes is that actually the intentional process of the selection of the, of the target leaks into the motor system. And that's kind of consistent with what um, Chu Yun and, and, and Ken Nakayaba uh, proposed in their 2009. So that's kind of leakage of, of cognitive processes. Right, okay, now we wanted to, to put this model a bit more to work. Right. So um, we had uh, my um, PhD student, uh, Phil Woodgate, he collected some data where he, uh, um, with a choice switching task, uh, where he put actually TDCS over the motor cortex, which is transcranial directly. Current simulation over the motor And we wanted to use the model to, to interpret his, his empirical fact. Um, so there, there, were two, there were three experiments. I'm just going to summarize the, mo the, the, the main one. And I'm happy to answer questions or the control, the control experiments. So what we found is um, so, so 
found that um, TDCS uh, modulated um, maximal deviation, so it modulated the curvature effect. It modulated it in, the, in a way you would expect it, so unknowable TDCS decreased uh, the priming effect and um, increased cathodal TDCS. Uh, increase the priming effect. So the cathodal, let's put it better, the cathodal and anodal effect was the kind of mixes expected. And we found that um, there was no TDCS effect on the initiated. So the start of the movements um, in the experiments was, was little affected by TDCS. So that was, that, that was one problem in this data, which we weren't quite sure how to, how to, what to make of it. But the dissociation, at least at that time, um, a few years ago, was, was a thing. Uh, not, really, not really published. The other uh, curious thing is that actually the motor called the TDCS effect of the motor on the motor quality had some sort of attention right? so that affected the, the priming, affected the color priming. So that's, that's sort of two things that were curious. The other thing we found together with the control experiment is that, that actually um, TDSS had only an effect when the target color was movement relevant. So when you introduce those color streaks, um, it becomes actually useful for participants to look out for the green item or to look out for the red item. Right? Not just look out for the odd color in the, in the display, but um, the actual color is seen, becomes useful to determine what the, um, what the target is. And, and, and that's what we found, found in those TDCS experiments. Only then, then it became it became, uh, then TDCS had an impact. And there's this dissociation. So we were kind of playing around how to implement, how to, to realize those, those experiments empirical data right, with, with core label. So obviously the first idea would have been um, to, uh, to TDCS the velocity map. Tweak the parameters of the velocity map in some ways, the globe inhibition, the excitation, local excitation in those, in those neural fields. Right? But the problem with that idea is that it, that it affects the initial latency and, and the maximum deviation together. So we wouldn't get a separation between the two. So what we decided, well, and then, yeah, and then we came across um, a paper by Tuck that suggested that actually um, the motor neurons could respond, could respond to colors which are movement random. So they are, that's an animal study where they ask uh, um, anim, an animal to make a uh, reaching movement, center out task, and, things. and when the color of the target was, was relevant um, to indicate what, what uh, which, which um, item on the, in the, the experiment was actually a target, then they found that the animal developed a sort of color kind of representation in the motor in the motor cord. Um, so we decided, okay, we'll give uh, Coralego those sort of motor priming units. So some kind of color units that, that store um, the, previous, uh, the previous color and then somehow it affects behavior. Next thing, well, yes, we then fed those motor priming units into the target selection stage, where it modulated the way the two color maps uh, affect the target selection, the detection of the target location. Right. So those motor priming units have a similar effect to the odd color detection. So that allowed us to implement um, a priming effect or that allowed us to implement the modulation of the priming effects through TDCS because we assume that TDCS hits those, those motor priming units. Right, so, so that's just, just another way of implementing 
and the primary effect on COVID. <clears throat> the second, the third, the third extension we did was we um, introduced the gating effect here on, on the output of the target, target hand difference and connected that gating effect, gating with the old color image. So that allowed us, well, to maintain the color priming effect um, on the initiator latency. So gating means that if the odd color isn't detected, the, the connection is switched, switched off. But as soon as the color detection, as soon as, soon as the odd color is detected, um, <clears throat> the gate opens and the peak, the activation here, feeds into the to move into the velocity map, and then the velocity map starts starts moving the speed the, the speed number. So that's a top set uh, reaching. But that depends on the descent on the color detection, which in turn then depends on the prime priming. So that allowed us to maintain the priming effect, but that priming effect was no longer affected by TDCS because TDCS happens here in the motor car. Right? It doesn't, TDCS doesn't affect our attention system. Um, but TDCS still affects the, uh, the curvature effect, to, uh, the curvature through those uh, modulation of the, of the color, of the color. Clear. So we were able to simulate essentially the, uh, uh, the TGCS effect. So here the curvatures, here the uh, reaching director and um, uh, to reaching trajectories for the, the switch trial and for the normal street trial, black, black line without, without TGCS and then with simulated TGCS, the anodal and the cathodal uh, effect on, on the trajectory. Okay, so we're kind of happy now. But what does it mean, right? All this sort of tweaking the architecture. Probably should also say initially I was really I was really hoping that we could get that just by the motor contact, right? By the, by uh, by, TV's, by changing the velocity. But unfortunately, we had to kind of go through those motions of changing the architecture to get to get just to simulate the TV. So what we thought this means is essentially that. The maximum de uh, deviation um, is, is, is the result of two, um, two priming effects, a sort of motor priming effect and the color priming. And so that's, yeah, the initial latency is actually an expression of finding the global feature in, um, in those experiments. So global in the sense that we now know that there's somewhere a lot of color Item, right? We don't know really where. That's kind of what, what kind of detection says and stage says. Right? And then, as soon as we know about that global color, uh, global color, um, we uh, we start moving. And I think Julian has Julian has some has some some data that speaks to that. Right? Um, <laughs> configuration administration. The other interesting story I thought comes out of this is that there's actually a feedback from the motor system to the attention of the so the <clears throat> so some somehow some for some reason right, the motor system influences actually where we intend it to. When I say motor system, I'm not talking about the planning, uh, which I think there's there's data for that, obviously. Um, now, what I'm talking about is more like the, the motor control system, the, the, the actually reaching, reaching system, the execution, the execution system of the, of the motor system influences the attention system. Um, okay, so I think I'll leave you, I'll leave you with that conclusion. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We have some time for. Uh, very interesting, thank you. Um, one
one thing I couldn't quite follow was in your initial, basically what looks like a salience map that starts with multiple targets and then converges. So that was, I think, your odd color detection example. There's clearly multiple targets. But when you got to your hand vector map, um, there's now only one direction being expressed. Um, so I'm just wondering, is, it all, is that always the case? And if that's the case, what's the, what's, where are you getting your average direction from if, if there's still more okay. than one thing being represented? No, no, sorry, that was, that's, yeah. Should include those illustrations. No, this is just, a, that's just the illustration for a single target. So, so the illustration for two targets would have two white dots. Would, yeah, exactly. And, but, but presumably you only have one velocity. One, one direction or do you simultaneously no no yeah, i just direction? have one i just have one velocity yeah. so then what so that's my question what, what's the process by which you're moving from two hand target differences to a single velocity uh an average it's just average okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so the yeah so the so yeah so if there were two 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 blocks here right the um the traveling wave would sort of average across those two and in the, in the average, in the average direction. I think it speaks to data that you've got. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know that the model wasn't uh, set up to address um, Jiyun's other studies where they looked at types of distraction. But suppose you were to try to extend it and capture that kind of data and some of these attraction effects. Um, do, you, do you think you need to, it seems to me that um, the um, phenomenon that we showed with the higher salient stimulus actually having less of an effect, suggesting some kind of over suppression mechanism which is maybe more effective when it's more salient. Um, that would presumably require another addition. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And how would you think that would, like, how would you go about doing that if you could do it on the spot? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, fun, fun, funny enough, I, I was quite curious about that data and uh, I have been, I've been thinking about that particular data a bit. So, um, right. Uh, So one would be one, one, one solution I don't like is kind of having uh, introducing two kind of selection um, mechanisms where, where one would essentially replicate the, the key press results and another one would, that would essentially replicate the, the, the reaching results. I mean, alternate, alternatively, um, you could also um, change the parameter settings of that additional mechanism depending on whether it's a reaching cut or whether it's a, a key press cut. Very boring solution. Um, <clears throat> what I find more interesting is actually, and I think that's a, that's, that's a slightly different interpretation of what, what the Fusion's paper says, is that um, there, there's, some, there's some suggestion that actually there's also uh, switching between three plant trajectories. Happening in those um, curved trajectories. Right? And Ju Yun's paper, <coughs> 2006 paper, uh, shows that, and I think Frank's data is also interpreted in this way. So, what you could think is that um, these pre planned trajectories ex um, exist for the normal regular items, but they don't exist for the singleton items. Now, if, now, because the normal singleton low salient item is similar to, to the regular reaching cut. It also activates those pre plants. Whereas the high salient um, uh, item is, is nowhere near those, those other items. And so it doesn't activate those pre plant trajectories. Hence, you get less of a curvature effect. So, So just a, a wild speculative uh, alternative for going for the less attractive uh, two, two, um, solution. Why don't you just 
model that you present uh, uh, task, just like the, the reaching task, uh, just considering the fact that it is actually the same. It's just that the, the, the trajectory is enormously short. Right? Uh, however, there may be slight uh, deviation that in a sense translates into lack, lack, lack of power or speed or whatever aspect of it you, you, you highlight. Uh, so that you have, right, when you have slow motion, keep press, then you may have this little deviation uh, here. Now that translates into formal reaction time. Right. So, would that be... Oh, oh I see. I so, see. so you can explain different kinds of data right. by pointing to the aspects of the task and not necessarily, let's say, go for changing. It just, so it's just the, the explanation and not just the model. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, that would still be testable by just <clears throat> making the task more similar by using the, the long way to go and things like that. Well, actually, from a motor control perspective, when you push a key, you're actually aiming for a, a position yeah. beneath the key. Yeah. Right. So it's not an outlandish idea to have a long line. Yeah. It's just that I, happens I, that the I, key I, in the I, way. I, I, yeah. I'm just, what I'm just thinking is whether it really translates into the effect that, that Ju Yun just Ju Yun found. Right? I, in principle, I think I like that idea to keep everything the same, just change the the amount, the, the plot travels or something, right? Yeah. So I, I sort of think that the solution is going to require something that's a little bit different for these inhibitory tags than the approach tags. I'm not, I have yet to see a framework where, especially just new the data where you get more distraction or less. It seems like something about the inhibitory tags and the way they carry over is going to have to be different than the way we thought about Reward tag. Maybe, I, might, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I can't. I haven't thought of a good one. Well, I mean, the, 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 my suggestion to relate to, refer to uh, cognitive control would, would let's say, <coughs> a totally different, uh, different system. I mean, you take lots of stuff for granted. So you take for granted that the goal, the overall goal, is, is permanent, <laughs> fixed, and always of the same, let's say, intensity. Now, my suggestion would be to question this, uh, and according to Bodvedic and others, to allow for fluctuation here. Now, you didn't want to model that here, but in the end, if you would want to have the perfect system, then we also want to add this. But there you can easily uh, get this, this in without, and again, I think that would not necessarily need to change the model as it exists right now. I've been thinking of a like, couple of alternative explanations for why the key pressing. Mm -hmm. So one of them is that because key pressing we need to measure the specific input feedback. So what if we be having more continuously measuring the pressure and the changes mm -hmm. over time? It might come from a yep. similar way. So for uh, for key, we change it one way or the other. We need to have we can use binary tools to see. <coughs> Or you can have like one of those times that starts to get the act of the action all into the curvature of saying it's going for energy. Like, like, so, so I mean, we, we did a little bit of that and showed that. Loss information is slower than reward information. So, so already the timing of different features and parameters is going to take a different amount of time. I still don't quite know how that gets me to more salient is less distracting, but I, I think it really could be a timing difference. Right, you're going to see it out. Like it may, it may, maybe it's easier to detect the difference, so it's inhibited faster. Yeah. One of the other aspects, though, about key press versus aiming is that the demands on the motor system, in terms of the accuracy demands, are much different. 
right? So, so we showed in the paper uh, that uh, off offset distractors, which don't have it, uh, a, tar a permanent target there, or a permanent source of information, uh, don't interfere with aiming movements, but they do interfere with key press movements because it's still a, a salient event. Um, so I, I don't know if we can treat uh, key press movements, just because the key press movements and aiming movements are the same because the demands are different, especially the continuous nature of But I suppose, um, not sure if I follow all the different areas and all that, but I think the, the TPCS is fairly kind of unspecific, right? So, you, so it's probably, it could have hit any of those areas as well, right? So, so it's quite an unspecific effect, so maybe that's why. Well, okay. So the motor priming is not is not like an emote. It's it's still a, it's still a perceptual. Um, that's not the area is the wrong word. But it, it's percep these are perceptual uh, neurons. Right? So these are neurons that are triggered by visual stimuli. Um, only they start. They found them only after um, the animal realized that the color was uh, relevant for the reaching. And I guess once, one, and that's the case also in those um, um, street tasks, right? color street tasks. So I guess these, 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 these um, neurons are recruited for that purpose and then are used for something else in, in, in different situations. Um, so it is, it is a fairly flexible system. Okay. Um, I might take the chair's prerogative and ask the last question and make a, make a comment if you don't mind. Um, a lot of the focus of a lot of these talks that have, and, and a lot of the work recently has, has been on, on movements that deviate towards distractors. Uh, some of the original work from Steve Tipper and, and Louise Howard and, and some, of, some of the work coming from our lab actually actually shows that you get deviations away uh, from, from certain objects depending on the time course of those. And I'm just wondering, I, I'm not a model person, and I'm just, it, it seems that this is a lot of aggregation. And I wonder how you can model some of these uh, deviation away. We, we, we talk about it in terms of concepts of inhibition, uh, but here we have only excitation, and, and I know computationally that that becomes much more complicated. So I'm wondering if you have any insights for that, or if anybody else has. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I remember a, a paper that I I'm still searching uh, that Steve Tipper uh, presented on an uh, attention performance 
long time guarding in England uh, someplace at this at the polo close to the polo field of Prince Charles. If, if there's there's some interest. Um, yeah, yes. Uh, and Queen Mom was sick this week, and so otherwise she would come back anyway. Uh, point being uh, that this was using these these uh, monkey uh, vector models. Uh, where you would, uh, let's say, if you would then uh, inhibit part of, let's say, this tractor stuff, they, these, these features, these contributions are stolen from the trajectory that then they actually transform into a repulsory uh, pathway. And I think that might very well fit to your data, namely, that the, the idea is that more similar. <coughs> Non-targets are more problematic because they are more difficult to reject. And if you reject, you steal more from the vectors contributing to the actual target. Whereas the, the more remote and, and separate and different in terms of uh, criteria, selection criteria or uh, space, the, uh, the, the distractor is, it may still attract attention as it were, but it can easily be discounted and the discounting doesn't cost you uh, vector space, as it were, and therefore no repulsion is produced. I can send you the thing. Excellent. <laughs> I'm really looking for this for, for many, I think many years, it, yeah. 30 years. So, so he published, exactly, he published a paper where um, he found a repulsive effect, a repulsion effect and, and attraction effect. And he also, also part of that paper is actually the, the model you just talked about. It's based on the, on the population coding exactly. by, by George Opelos. Exactly. And then he introduced some, some inhibition and some expectation. Yes. And, and, and because at the end, in the A&P paper, it, it never really, it was different from the, from the talk. That's I see, I I see so maybe there's something that happened. And I, 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 I wrote to George Houghton, who never replied back. So. <laughs> <laughs> the other nice thing about that model is it that was the earliest yeah. that I had yeah. ever seen. Right. And so, but in, in, as a function of proximity to the hand, mm -hmm. like the projected hand pass, mm -hmm. not in eye or head centered form. It's really fascinating. Yeah, and then I would just say on this general point about moving away from stuff. So my, my PhD thesis is on obstacle avoidance. So I spent a long time thinking about what is it that drives you away. And I, I took exactly that model and then essentially pictographically said, well, and then using um, Daniel Baldwin and George um, Bell's yeah. attentional landscapes, and just like, what if there's a landscape that drives behavior and we've got peaks of things we want to move towards and valleys that we want to move away from? And it's not actually that hard once you have that landscape and then just say, hey, let the hand traverse this map. And it, and it mostly does what you think. And so to Tim's point, I think that we can imagine just like a space you said, because a map of things in space, and then things we want to move away from, we just dip in the valley of that just to create some sort of propulsive field. It doesn't need to be much more than that. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. It's just I, I, in these kind of models, as I said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure how you model that, how you, how you put things in there. I think conceptually it makes sense. I'm just, I'm just not a model which I'm to, but conceptually it makes sense. Yeah, so I mean, you mean from a neural implementation standpoint? Well, if in, in any one of these kinds of competitive fields, yeah. um, it, they're sort of self-normalized. So yeah. if you push something up, the other things push down. If you push things down, other things push up. And so that will shift the fields of activity away from the tractor, et cetera. And, and I think, you know, uh, what, what Tipper has done um, was actually what I based my uh, attempts at simulating this kind of stuff. And, it, and I think it's, it all goes back to like the old people, the propulsion and traction stuff. They're still in psychology and they, they actually make this decision as well. Um, and, and that? Sure. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Field, field, field. Yeah, actually, on the kind of the kind of trees with that 